Basel Top Spartans, happy Tuesday, April 16th. Today, uh, we are talking about security analysis, different ways to, again, to determine whether or not we should invest in a company, as well as different investment strategies. Uh, you should have completed the Chapter 12 reading guide and make sure that is submitted today uh, before you begin, after I cover this information with you, before you begin the Chapter 13 reading guide, questions 16 through 20. 16 through 20. Uh, the first 15 questions ballpark are a little bit of a review, so I'm not going to assign that to you. We've already more or less covered it. I'll just briefly review it with you tomorrow. So we're talking analysis and investment strategies. You've got chapter 13, questions 16 through 20 to read. It's only five questions. So my guess is if you didn't complete chapter 12 yet, you probably want to get that in. Let's get down to it. Again, we're digging into how do we determine what companies we should invest in. We're going to talk about earnings per share, and we're going to talk about price to earnings ratio. Again, different ways of evaluating companies. Now, I'm, before I begin, I want to make sure that when we're trying to evaluate companies, we're talking about companies of the same industry. So I'm not saying compare General Motors to Target. They're in completely two different in two completely different industries. And I'm not saying compare Apple to Tesla, still different industries. We're trying to find what company of individual industries should we invest in. So when we talk about earnings per share and we talk about price to earnings ratio, we are talking about picking the best companies of various industries. You guys already know what industries you are invested in. You can look at, at the companies you have already bought and think, to myself, and think to yourselves, retail, pharmaceutical, entertainment, technology, pretty straightforward. Let's talk about earnings per share. The earnings per share will tell you how much money the company is making per individual share sold to the public. All right, let's talk about Tesla. We talk, and I, we kind of touched on this last week. Tesla right now is being traded at $175.78 a share. Nissan is being traded at 585 uh, yen. In General Motors is being traded at $43.89 a share. Which is the better company? We could go back and look at, I believe I have this set to a year. Tesla is the blue one. They have... Uh, well, for a time period, we're performing pretty well. And then now they're losing money. And then we have uh, General Motors. Uh, they were more or less staying flat. Then they lost some money. Now they're coming back. And then you've got Nissan, who's more or less been up and down, but still on the positive side for an extended period of time. Is that the best way to determine what company we could invest in? Earnings per share might give you a little better idea of what the company is actually doing with the money they get from the public, with the money with the money they get from investors. So if we were to go in here and look, again, I think I talked a little bit about this last week. That's the wrong one. Slide down here. For every share that Tesla has sold to the public up until the end of December this year, they made $2.26 a share. Is two bucks and 26 cents profit good enough for you? And if we were to compare that to Nissan, Nissan has made $1.14 per share. Interesting. And then we can go to General Motors. General Motors made $1.60 per share up until December this year. What is the better investment? Is it $1.60? Per share? Is it the dollar fourteen? Or is it two dollars and twenty six cents? I think Tesla is making you want to call that twice as much money, twice as much money per share. Okay. But we also have to consider here how much money you have to pay for it. Do you want to pay $175 per share to earn $2.60? Do you want to pay, by the way, 585 yen 
um, that's three dollars and eighty two cents. Do you want to pay uh, three dollars and eighty two cents to earn? I believe it was a buck sixty, or do you want to pay forty three dollars to earn? I'm gonna go back to it. A dollar sixty. Again, it's a different way of analyzing. If you've got a big bankroll, if you've got hundreds of thousands of dollars to invest, then you may want to be able to, you may want to invest your money in a $175 per share Tesla. If you don't have a lot of money, perhaps you consider Nissan or General Motors. Again, it's just a different way of evaluating what you want to invest your money in, dependent on how much money you have. Right? It's a way of evaluating the expected return that you can get from your investment. Another way to uh, uh, analyze a company is the price to earnings ratio. This is going to tell you how much you're going to have to pay to earn a single dollar of profit. How much you're going to have to pay to earn a single dollar of profit. So let's do Tesla again. Tesla is traded at $175 a share. Here is the price to earnings ratio for Tesla. To make one single dollar of profit from investing in Tesla, you're going to be expected to pay $50. To earn one single dollar of profit from Nissan, you're going to have to pay seven dollars and fifty cents seven dollars 49 cents but we're going to round up there and we could do the exact same thing again with general motors to earn a single dollar of profit for general motors you're going to pay six dollars and 14 cents and again finding this information so i would imagine some of your brains are melting over right now to find to find um uh this information it's a it's a simple google search Find a couple of car companies you want to invest in. Find a couple of retail companies you want to invest in. Find a couple of pharmaceutical companies you want to invest in. And then you just get on the little Google, tip 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 tap tap, and type in what is the P to, what is the price to earnings ratio for company Y, company X, company Z. See which one has the cheapest amount of money necessary to earn a dollar of profit. One thing I do want to point out to you both for their earnings per share and the price to earnings ratio is they may talk about the uh, earnings per share being leading or trailing or the price uh, uh, PDE ratio price per earnings ratio being leading or trailing leading is what's predicted for the future. The next 12 months trailing is the previous 12 months. They might have it listed as TTM trailing 12 months or LTM, leading 12 months. But it's just, both of these are just ways to evaluate how much bang you can get for your buck. A lot of you go to the casino. Do you enjoy playing five or $10 hands or do you enjoy playing 25 or $50 hands where you get the minimum that you have to put in is 50 bucks versus five or 10? Again, it's a way for you to analyze what is the best chance to get a return and how much you are going to have to pay to get that return. Now we can talk about, well, there's one, there's another, another analysis of, of uh, companies to invest in and it's called the SWOT analysis. It's really nothing that complicated, right? SWOT, an acronym, strength, weakness, opportunity, threats. Let's talk Tesla. Elon Musk, is there any question that Tesla is the leader in electronic vehicles? No question about that. Strength. They are strength. Is there any question that Elon Musk is nuts? That's a weakness. And that's probably a threat. In addition, every other car company in the world is trying to develop a cheaper, more efficient, more accessible electric vehicle. Is that an opportunity for Tesla? I think not. Is that a weakness of Tesla? I think it is. And it's also a threat. Again, 
any of these analysis, whether it is earnings per share, price to earnings ratio, or the SWOT analysis, you can't compare a car company to a pharmaceutical company. You can't compare a pharmaceutical company to a technology company. It's for compares, comparing companies of the same industry against one another. I don't know why I have this on here, but again, this kind of gets back to dispositions and behaviors uh, that people have when it comes to investment, all right? The people that think they can beat the market. There's the whole fundamental versus a technical, and really one is not better than the other, but having an understanding of both is logical, just basic economic sense. The fundamental analysis of uh, economies, industries, looks at economic principles. You look at, is the economy growing or shrinking? Right now, we're teetering. We're back and forth. We don't know what the future has for us. Are we going to fall into a recession and a bear market? Or are we going to dodge another economic downturn and go into an expansion, a bull market? We don't know, right? We're dealing with inflation, high interest rates, political instability. God only knows. And then we can look at the strengths of an industry as well as the company. Technical analysis, again, some economic components here. We focus on supply and demand. So we think about Tesla. The demand for electronic cars is increasing. People don't want to pay high gas prices anymore. That's a benefit for Tesla. But there are other competitors that Tesla is going to have to deal with that aren't being run by a sociopath. One very much looks at... Um, the future, trying to guess what will happen. One very much technical analysis, very much focuses on the past and talks about human emotion, fear, greed. One isn't necessarily better than the other. You're going to need to have an understanding of both. Should we put our money in all at once or should we put our money in slowly over the course of time? It depends right? What will likely happen for you in the future is you will put money into the market in your retirement account every time you get paid. You will have a 403B, you will have a 401k, you get paid every 15 days when you get paid. Your company will send a portion of your salary and potentially match. We'll get more into that later. They'll put it in over the course of the year, right? Every 15 days. I don't know if that is necessarily better than saving up your money all year long and making one contribution at the end of the year. It really depends what is going on. If the market is rapidly expanding, then we would probably want to put all of our money in as soon as possible. Because if our economy is expanding, that means prices are increasing. And if you don't put your money all in at the beginning, that means you're paying higher prices for securities, for stocks. At the same point in time, if our economy is contracting, our stock prices are going down, it would probably be better to put our money in slowly over the course of time. So each time we put in money, we're being able to buy more because we're putting money in as prices drop. There really isn't one way to skin the cat here. And you can look at, and I'll open this up and zoom in here. You can look at the comparison here. And this is from your textbook. You have one person who is doing Dollars, dollar cost averaging. They're putting up the same amount of money in more or less every pay period versus someone who is putting in the exact same amount of money, $4,000, $4,000. They're putting in the exact same amount of money into the same company. And at the end of the year, we can see what they have. The lump sum person put all of their money in the first year of the first quarter. We'll call it January 1 put in $4,000 and by the end of the year, of year two in the fourth quarter, they made an, they made $160 in profit versus the person who put their money in slowly over the course of each quarter for two years, the same $4,000 made 4,320, sorry, made $326, so almost twice as much. Just because your book says that they made more money doesn't mean that's always going to happen. What is dependent here is whether or not the market was going up and down. The benefit of doing dollar cost averaging is that if you know that you're putting money in every 15 days, then we can minimize our 
behavior, our disposition, that we are going to beat the market. Because then you're going to try to time it and you're going to be too late or you're going to be too early. Um, most of us do dollar cost averaging because we put money in, we make a contribution into our savings every time we get paid. Another one is buy and hold. And again, this kind of goes with dollar cost averaging. We're talking about putting the money in and letting it be, right? Here's the thing why we should put our money in and just be done with it. And again, you want to spread it out over a year, spread it out over a year. You want to do it all at once, do it all at once. Either way, it'll buff out in the end. The important thing is, is once you put it in, you let it be, let it alone. Don't touch it. Because here's the thing. We kind of already talked about this with gross versus net profits. If you're buying and selling constantly, each time you are paying a transaction fee and you're probably paying taxes. And you're going to pay a higher tax rate if you don't have your securities long enough. If you don't hold them for at least one year, you will pay income tax versus capital gains tax. You can see it here. Here are all the tax rates in the United States. 10% if you make less than $10,000 as a single person a year, and 37% if you are a single person who makes over a half a million dollars. So if you're a person who makes all, well, let's let's just, we're, we're, most of us will be in the 24% tax bracket, meaning you're a single person you make between 86,000 and we'll call that $165,000 a year. If you buy a stock, Costco, and you make $1,000 on it, and you have it for less than one year, then you are paying 24%, meaning you are giving up $240 of your profit if you sell it within a year. If you hold on to it for one year and one day, you go from paying 24%, $240 to the long-term capital gains rates, which is for, what did we say? 160, sorry, $86,000 to $165,000 a year. That puts you in the 15% tax uh, capital gains tax bracket, which means you would pay $150 versus $240. I'm no genius, but I'm not a fool. Something tells me I would rather pay $150 versus $240 and keep the extra 90 for myself. Well, there you're putting it in over the course of the year, your, your contributions over the course of the year or all at once. I don't care really won't make a difference. You have to, I would strongly encourage you to keep it for at least a year so you're not paying income tax on it compared to capital gains taxes. Capital gains tax is going to be less, if any at all, based on your income. And the real crux of the matter is potentially, potentially the capital gains, the increased money that you made from your stock price going up, it could put you in another tax bracket, meaning let's say you're at $164,000 and you made $2,000 in a capital gains profit. Costco went up $2,000. You don't pay 24%, that bumps you up to 32%, which if it's $2,000, you're paying, do the math, carry the two, $640 in tax versus come down here, $300 in tax. Buy it, let it alone, leave it. I believe that is all I have for information here with you today. Yes, it is. Chapter 12, turn it in. You have 16, 16 through 20. 16 through 20, we'll do a quick review of bonds. We'll talk about preferred stocks uh, tomorrow. And then you have some time to get some investment done the next $5,000, correct, $5,000 into the stock market. Hope you're all well. Make sure you're listening to Mr. Vyth, uh, and I'll see you again for the third time virtually tomorrow. Go Spartans.